record session. Okay. I guess it's recording. Okay, cool. Uh, I mean, we can get started. Salah, a lot of this stuff is can be intuitive. I don't know, like everybody, each one of you is probably in a different level. Um, but I'm guessing uh, like either pre match like matched or pending, like applying to the match or doing some internal medicine related, probably. Uh, so this first session is how to admit a patient. It's, it's simple to say, you know, how to admit a patient. But uh, this is from my own personal experience, Yani. They were like, okay, go admit this patient. I had no idea what to do. Yani, what does it even mean to admit a patient? Um, so I'm going to try to go over like step by step what you need to do and how do you finish everything when you're admitting a patient. Okay, so let's start. So uh, when you're starting how to admit a patient, first you need to know, Aslan, where is the patient coming from? So uh, most patients come from where? They come from like home. They were at home or whatever, and then you know they get sick and then they, they show up to the hospital. So most patients will come from home, okay? And then they will end up in the ER. Okay, some people, by the way, when you, if you're not familiar with this, some, some people say ED instead of ER, same thing, emergency department versus emergency room, but it doesn't matter what you say. <laughs> um, so most people will come from home to the ER. And then if they meet certain criteria to get admitted to the hospital, Saita, then you will get called. And then once a patient is admitted, they will be transferred to the floor, which is usually into, into your floor, like whatever you're gonna be working in, it's gonna be like the medical floor. Um, unless you're doing like surgery, then it's be like the surgical floor, whatever. And another source of admissions, uh, sometimes what's gonna happen in the you know, some patients who go to their PCP clinic, or they go to subspecialty clinic, when they go to GI clinic, or they go to hepatology, whatever clinic. Um, and then the people at the clinic, they feel like the patient is too symptomatic to be treated as an outpatient and will need admission. And so sometimes these patients also get sent to the ER, okay? Hala, into your responsibility as, a, as an intern is to admit the patient and the, the the way you're gonna the way you're gonna approach it and you're gonna get paged or uh, your senior whoever is covering yani whoever is working with you on the team you guys are admitting you'll get you receive a page that patient x needs to be admitted and then patient x can be either in the er or can be already on the floor and the patient whistle on the floor and they, you just need they, they they didn't page you like beforehand and then you will receive the page that patient needs to be admitted before we move on, there's only there's also another way where patients can arrive to the hospital, which is if they come from what we call an outside hospital, OSH. You will see this uh, this acronym OSH. You will see it a lot. It just means outside hospital, um, and these people sometimes, yeah, I mean, outside hospitals, depending on where you're working at. Between that and your hospital is specialized into something very, very specific, or the outside hospital never had that thing. So they will transfer the patient. So they will transfer the patient um, to the floor. These patients who are transferred from hospital to hospital usually come from their floors to your floors directly. They bypass the ER. They don't go to the ER. Okay. Also remember these patients, Libijum and outside hospitals. لازم the level of care it can نفسها يعني if somebody can be ICU in an outside hospital when they're transferring from an ICU from an outside hospital to your hospital لازم يجي على ICU you can't step down level of care or step up it has to be the same but supposedly you're on the floors usually they will come eventually to your floor okay any questions here All good? All right, cool. Okay, so um, this is kind of the, the flow chart of how patients will eventually arrive to you. Hello, once you get that page, so you will get paged and no uh, patient X. 
to be admitted. Okay, and so now it now it's your turn. Now it's uh, it's your job to go and admit this patient. And people do it differently. By by no means by no means is this the only way of doing things. There are many many ways of doing things, but at least this is the way. And I learned. So this is the way that I do it. Of how how did I admit my own patients? Okay, of how I learned like over the over the years how to admit patients. Um, you have to be efficient a lot of the times لأنه, there's a lot of things that you have to do and if you miss anything then it's a problem so i like to kind of break it down into four four different categories okay awal wahda lihi admission orders these are the orders you you're going to place uh, in the EMR in the electronic medical records that tells the nurse what to do exactly. It tells the, it, it exactly it transfers the patient from your care to another, to, to, to the actual floor, from the, e, from the ER or from another facility to your actual care. And then it also adds like few things. Hello, we'll go over them. But I will watch some admission orders and we'll go over them. Then number two comes your job, which is you got to see the patient. Okay, so after, uh, this is what I like to do is you put in your admission orders and now you transfer all the care to you and then you go and see the patient. Some, some people will switch these around. They will say, hey, listen, I want to go see the patient first and then put in my admission orders. That's all also acceptable. But I'll tell you what happens. If you do that, you see the patient and then you're spending like, you know, your excellent care. You're spending like an hour talking to the patient, getting history, blah, 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 physical exam. Meanwhile, there's no admission orders. Um, that will prolong their stay in the ER, or they're still not under your care, or the nurse is not is going to start paging you, hey, what do we need for this patient? Do we need to get vitals? Blah, 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 blah. And so, and I find it very helpful in the first put in those admission orders. Adult admission orders are very, very generic. You don't need anything to know anything about the patient to place these orders. Just you need to have general knowledge. And then you see the patient. And then when you see the patient, you know, you're going to, you're going to do, you're going to take your HPI, you're going to do your physical exam, um, whatever. Okay, so you're going to talk to the patient, essentially. Hello. Step three and four, uh, step three, after you see the patient, I know what I find it helpful, you know, into after you see the patient, after you do your physical exam, at this point, you already formulated an idea about what the patient is in for, what am I going to do for the patient later on? What kind of plan do I have for the patient? Again, a lot of people like at this point to start writing their HN, HNP and, and write the, the admission notes. Me personally, and I don't like to write the HNP now. What I like to do right now is based on my plan, yani method and somebody coming in with CHF, somebody coming in with GI bleed or something, I start putting all the orders and start process all the things that I need to do to the patient right now before I even write anything, okay? So what I like to do now is place my diagnostic and my therapeutic orders, okay? As well as consult who I need to consult and do everything. And then my final step would be something to write the, the HPI or the HMP notes, okay? Again, these are kind of interchangeable, but, but this is kind of the way I like to go over things, okay? Hello. out of all these, what do you think is the most important step? What do you guys think out of these four? I'd say seeing the patient. Seeing the patient? Who else, anybody, anybody wants to agree, disagree? Yeah, that's the classic thing in seeing patients classic. during I the physical think, exam. I think the most important step is this one. Most important. You know why? Um, yeah, you're going to see the patient. <laughs> but even if you saw the patient and you missed one order, that's going to be like almost catastrophic. I'll tell you an example. I'll give you an anecdote. This happened to me Anna, when I was an intern. I saw a patient who had uh, who presented with acute onset of paralysis. Oh, MRI. MRI showed that he had uh, acute cord compression. 
So I saw the patient, I made the best physical exam. Hatta in my note, I, I, I like located exactly where is the, the, the defect or, you know, when you do the physical exam, pen prick, or, like the, the most beautiful neurologic exam, hatta pictures or sources, like everything. My, my, my HNP was the most beautiful thing in the world. Okay. And then, you know, I consulted neurosurgery, consulted oncology because he had a mass. Like I just did everything. Okay. But you know what I, what I forgot? I left the, like I finished all everything and then I signed out the patient and I left. And in my HNP, it says all the plan perfectly. Like I did everything for this patient. And then in my plan says, you know, there is an acute cord compression. What's the most important thing to do with acute cord compression? Somebody who has steroids. Steroids. Okay. I forgot to place the order for steroids. I did everything, everything correct. Even in my notes says give dex, dexamethasone, give the, everything. But then I forgot to put it in as an order. The patient got delayed to get the steroids because I didn't put it in. But that's why from then I just realized, in the, wait a minute, type HMP, you can always write. You can always like go back and write your note, blah, 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 cover yourself. But if you write something and you end up not doing it, al fadi you know, like it's like you, you, you missed it. I feel like really putting in those diagnostic therapeutic orders just get it over with. Put them, ikhlas. Then while you're writing the note, you're going to remember, oh, I didn't place this order. Then you can place it. But I feel like really placing the orders, it, you, will, you will learn it eventually. You know, it's really, really the most important thing. And we learned them in, in medical school, not written, not done. Yeah, this is it. Not written, not done. You didn't write it. It's never going to be done if you don't put in the order. Well, most of the time, into you're the weakest link. Into your like... People rely on, on you and you're attending, your senior are going to tell you, hey, give the patient antibiotics, give the, do blood cultures, give the patient antibiotics. If you don't put, put in the order, it's not going to happen. But then it's going to be delayed 24, 48 hours. The hadith mahada, you know, if done, and no, uh, the order was never placed. So that, that's why I feel like this is really one of the most important things. Okay. So let's uh, let's start by reviewing these things okay i'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about this like admission orders okay so number one admission orders okay show any admission orders maybe some of you will be familiar with this but i know when i came here i was completely unfamiliar with what the hell is admission orders in general there is every hospital you will work at has like an order set that initiates admitting a patient and this order set will have a lot of things but the most important things I will mention now. Number one, it's gonna have an, some sort of admit order, okay? So this admit order essentially says the patient is admitted to, to which service? Is the patient admitted to like medicine? Is the patient admitted to GI if you have an inpatient? Is the patient admitted to liver service, renal, whatever. So you will have to, to choose like a service that the patient will be admitted to and then it will also have the attending name. So you will also have to, to know who's the attending, who's gonna be taking care of the patient. And eventually every patient has to be taken care of by an attending. If you're on the medical floors, this attending is gonna be a hospitalist. This is just a general medicine doctor who like covering the shift at that time. Now then the hospitalists usually they transfer it to each other, they cover each other, and that's out, out of your bounds. That's into what you're supposed to do to know who you're attending, who's accepting and then put in that name over there, okay? It will also have the reason, uh, the reason for admission. Again, the reason for admission um, it could be as simple as shortness of breath, or it could be more elaborate, something like pneumonia or like UTI, or something like that. And then one of the important things in the admission order, this, this might vary from hospital to hospital, but uh, a lot of the time, it I think it will be present. I, know, I think it's uh, it's being dictated by by Medicare or those bigger institutes. You know, this has to be in the admit order, and this is the sort of bed that the patient will require. But specifically, if the patient requires tele versus no tele, what is tele? Tele is telemetry, which means does the patient require continuous. Um, like EKG monitoring with, with tele, with like uh, continuous blood, not continuous, but yani, like essentially is the patient going to be hooked up to a monitor or this monitor going to be watched on the telemetry monitor or not? And some patients don't require that. Some patients do. Okay. 
هلا واتس فور يو تو نو انه هاو ذا هيل دو يو نو صح انت يور انترن يو جست ستارتنج يو دونت نو لايك دوز ذيس بيشنت نيد تيلي ولا دوزنت نيد تيلي اوكي I'll tell you what this telly versus no, no telly can be subjective but I'll tell you the objective things and the telly there is three classes of who requires telly there's class 1 indication okay and then there's class 2 and class 3 okay i think as an intern into you're supposed to know what's class 1 indication class 1 indication it means somebody who has an enstemi for example somebody who's acute coronary syndrome somebody uh, who has afib or arrhythmia okay these people have to be on telly stroke people have to be on telly syncope have to be on telly okay these things are like class 1 indication and no if somebody comes in and shows up with syncope or some sort of arrhythmia you can't just place them without hooking up to the monitor or continuously watching their heart rate for example so these people you have to hook them up to tell you class 2 and class 3 are less kind of you know they i don't memorize them off the top of my head i don't expect you to um but they're more like subject really it becomes like more and more subjective when we get to class 3 but class 1 they're like objective like boom this this person needs to be on telly so you have to place you have to place that telly order and the reason i'm saying this is because when you admit somebody to telly and this is might be beyond the scope but when you admit somebody to telly and why Why do hospital care about this? Lesh, yani the question is, lesh ma tahut kulla nas ala telly. Hala number one, <laughs> there isn't enough telly monitors in the in the hospital. Yani the hospital might be 500 beds. They're not going to have 500 telly monitors to 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 go around. They might have like I don't know 30 of their capacity telly monitors. So you have to kind of ration who needs telly and who doesn't. That's why they created this. Number two is that when you admit somebody to telly, it's like a higher class of admission than somebody who's not on telly. Yani the cost to the hospital is going to be higher than somebody who's not on telly it goes into like whatever it's something you, you don't care about these things administrative stuff and i urge you not to care too much about them but just know they exist oh, you will see you will start to get pushback from the nurses or from the administration oh does this person really need telly do can't you just admit them to like normal whatever so you will you will get these things but for you into your job as a resident as an intern is to learn medicine <laughs> not to learn administration not to learn scut work not to learn how to draw blood your your job is to learn how to make decisions um and, and all these things yani will help you but um, i think the most important the most important thing for you to remember always is am i learning like what am i doing when i do these things so you have to kind of learn but you have to also learn how to tell the nurses what to do that's why these admission orders are important okay Uh, number two is like again something also silly you don't you never think about it so uh, somebody admitted to the hospital they're going to have an iv so they're going to have an iv but you never think about it it's it's actually an iv access it's an order you have to place an order that says hey iv access for the patient. please maintain the iv access for the patient you have to place an o2 order and the o2 order is going to say hey if the patient is like desatting to 95% place them on nasal cannula if desatting to 90% place them on something else it's like a step ladder of things you also have to place an order that says please get the vitals like q4 hours every four hours get the vitals for the patient okay and then something very silly <laughs> that we just talked about telly so hakana you're admitting the patient to telly and your admission order is going to say this patient is admitted, admitted under telly This alone is not enough to to place the patient on telly. The telly order has to be a different order. Ooh. Again, you will remember this. You will remember this when you go there and you forget to put the telly order and the nurse starts running after you. Hey, please place the telly order, whatever. But you just have to know that the telly order is an actual order. The admission order that has telly, no telly is like more an administrative thing. It's not the actual order. And then finally, this is going to be for all patients. is something called code status anybody knows what code status is بجوز مش مره على الكل كود ستاتس think full code versus dnr yes so DNI. essentially it's exactly it's what's the code status for the patient what's agreed upon it's again it's an order in the system that has to go in 
Well, this tells the, the system essentially if the patient is full code or if the patient has like some sort of do not resuscitate, do not intubate, do not hospitalize, do not place a Foley. Like there's a lot of things. It's all like legal, uh, but you know, you should, it has to be, it has to come from you. It has to come as a formal order. And no, this code status, usually depending on where you work at, if they use Epic, if you use other, other things, it's going to show up like under the patient in the full code, DNR, whatever. So I think these three are kind of, uh, these three parts of admission orders are kind of um, universal for all, for all places. Again, remember, uh, yani when you look at this, so you don't really need to see the patient to place these orders. You already That's know. Yeah. I'm sorry. Somebody wanted to ask a question, I think. No. Okay, cool. So you don't really need to see the patient like to kind of know how to place these admission orders. Okay, so you, you're gonna just place them as is. Okay, so number two, we're gonna, see the patient now, so, so this is what I like to do. And I, after I place these orders, I go and like actually physically uh, see the patient. And really what I like to do in, uh, in the, again, you're, you already had an idea, especially if somebody coming from the ER and I'll give you, I'll give you some, um, some tips and tricks, but if somebody is like coming from the ER, um, there, what do you think, what do you think is the, like the most accurate source of information, especially when you're chart reviewing, somebody comes to the ER uh, and then you have like, you know, an ER physician booked a note and the patient presented with cough, whatever is they have, then admitted to medicine. Uh, what do you think is gonna be like a, a really good source of information? The Allergies? Yeah, but I mean, in terms of like knowing what the patient came in with, like a, a most like really objective information. Is it the physician's note, the nurse note? What do you think is gonna be? It's kind of counterintuitive, but. So what I found over the years and uh, the most like kind of rely, like the most reliable source of information, and the ED physicians, you know, like book to and the patient has been having cough, ups and come yom, you know, they, they, they add stuff, or they want to admit the patient. But it's not that they lie, they just like write their impression into the history. So you don't get an objective source of exactly what happened to the patient. So what I found is helpful in you know, there is something called a triage note. A triage note is the note. يعني احيانا بتكون لما البيشنت اول ما يوصل تيجي هاي الاتندنت على على الويندو بتساله انت واي ار يو هير اند ذن شي رايتس داون اكزاكتلي وات هي سيز او وات شي سيز اور ات كان بي ذا ريبورت فروم ذا امبولانس اللي بسموهم اي ام اس ذا ايمرجنسي ميديكال سيرفيسز هدول بكتبوا هيك لايك ون لاين اكزاكتلي ون لاين وات هابن اي فيل لايك ذيس ترياج نوت أنا to me, I found it the most reliable source of information that exactly, exactly what happened to the patient. So a lot of times what I do is I read that one the ER physician will miss some things or will have some sort of impression, will add things to his notes. So it's not like 100% reliable, but uh, the, the, that triage note, I, I urge you to, to read it. So I'm just gonna put it here, read triage notes. Okay, and then you go and you're gonna see the patient. Okay, so when you see the patient, you're gonna do your HMP that you learned in medical school, sah, and no, and uh, this is what I do. You know, I, what is she ask ask about the chief complaints, right? So what are they in for if they can talk? Otherwise, you need to get uh, what we call collateral. You're gonna hear this word a lot, collateral. Collateral means and like you're trying to gather information from collateral sources, من الأهل, من التليفون, من nursing home, something like that. Okay. So what I usually ask, ask about the chief complaint. And then I start talking to the patient before I get into the story. Uh, I want to kind of establish kind of the, the full history before I forget. So what I usually do is I ask them about their home medications. And then I ask them about their pharmacy. 
And then if I can get call the pharmacy or sometimes some the Epic or EMR, they're connected to a lot of pharmacies. So they pull in all the information. So patient okay. And then I try to establish some social history, you know, smoking history, um, alcohol. You'll see this ETOH, it's alcohol. Um, I wasn't used to it. That's why I'm saying it. If they use drugs, uh, et cetera, all that stuff. Okay. And then I also try to establish family history. Um, and then finally, you know, uh, past surgical history, uh, past medical history, what the, whatever they had surgeries, especially if they had like abdominal surgeries, pretty important. And then after like, after I ask all these, I go back to the actual HPI story. And then I start dwelling into exactly what happened to the patient and what happened to you, how did you end up here, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then go throughout the whole story. And then finally, you know, you want to do your physical exam. Okay. And then once you do all this, a lot of us will forget to do this final and most like one of the most important steps, which is ask about code status, confirm code status with the patient. Uh, the way you confirm it is number one, you ask them, okay? Well, uh, it's, I know it's gonna be awkward into the matbal show. It's gonna be a little awkward to ask patients, oh shit, our meeting will end in 10 minutes, okay? It's okay. Can we, we were after like uh, five, once it ends, I'm going to start a new meeting. Is that okay, guys? And then I'll share it with you on the thing on the, I think you can, you can open the same one, but I'm not sure. Hopefully. I'll have link. Okay, perfect. Perfect. I'll just restart it. Um, so yeah, so code status, it's, it's going to be kind of awkward, though, you know, uncomfortable for you when you start like to ask a patient, hey, do you do you want to be intubated, especially in like you're new or mapped out of careful kilimat, you don't know how to like talk to, to the patient, at least that was like Anna, my, my problem. I think it's a skill, you're going to have to learn it. That's one of the things I found helpful in Ahkilum. This is a thing we ask all our patients and, and we're not asking you to, we're asking you if you want to get intubated. But this is just a normal thing. We have to ask all our patients. Um, the other thing is some patients will have legal documents. Legal document will, will have stated like DNR, DNI. Uh, you will be in a situation where somebody has a legal document that, say, that says their DNR, DNI. But the patient in front of you, full code. what would you do at that point? What do you think is, is the next step? Anybody? Okay. Maybe assessing the demand. Again, say again. Maybe assess his uh, mental status. If he has dementia or something like that, I would stick to the... Good. So you, you want to get some collateral information to see like if they're awake, alert, and oriented, blah, blah, blah. But if they are, if they are, then really you are bound by what they say, not by what's... Legal. Yeah, patient's wishes. Mm. So enter, you see that the patient wishes change it. Hello, what you can do, what you can do is bring a new form. Uh, a broad default. Back again, uh, sorry, mathematical book. Sorry. Hello. What, what you can? I was saying. What you can do is bring a new paper or fill in with the new wishes, which you can. Uh, most of the time, this will require the attending to sign off for you. But enter command as a resident. Uh, you're a doctor at the end of the day, so you can actually witness this and 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 change their status. Well, don't be afraid to do so. So you have to you have to ask the patient. At the end of the day, enter what you, what you want is what's shula uh, maslahat al patient at the end of the day, okay? All right, cool. Uh, let me let me restart the meeting since I'm get, there's, uh, we're gonna move on to a, another um, section. Oh, but then, hold on, let me just make sure that this meeting, okay, we're gonna, sorry, now it's recording. A lot of the time, it, it's gonna be these labs that you're gonna order um, for tomorrow, which means you're gonna, you know, uh, you're going to have to learn how to place orders for tomorrow. Like, for example, on Epic, it's like T plus one it, or like T plus one day or something. Or T plus one actually gives you like a tomorrow. You know, it's going to place 
or n plus one, now plus one, it means now plus one day is gonna place the order for tomorrow instead of for today. So remember, so the orders you're gonna end up placing for most of, for most of the time, for most patients are gonna be either like a CBC plus a basic metabolic panel or BNP plus others. Okay, so most of the time, these are the general labs that are recurring every day. The patient that is in the hospital, they're going to draw like a new BNP. They're going to draw a new CBC every day in the morning. Okay. And depending whether the hospital, depending on which hospital you're in, uh, the, the, the morning people, you know, either the nurse or the phlebotomist, they have a specific time where they show up. We're going to draw the patient and we're going to draw the patient's labs. So they make their rounds. They just draw like blood from all the patients. Okay, so you're gonna place your labs for tomorrow. And then you're gonna, you're, this also includes labs that you're gonna place for whatever, like not necessarily, like sometimes you need extra labs, but I'm not gonna go into that, okay? The, the next thing to, to place is imaging. Imaging or, or other, like other diagnostic modalities. Like for example, I'll give you an example, chest X-ray. Okay, you have to place that order that I need a chest X-ray for the patient. Okay, if you want an EKG that hasn't been done, most of the time the ED are great at doing EKGs, but if you want like serial EKGs, every day you want to get an EKG on the patient, you have to place that order. Okay, um, if you're doing like a CT, if you're doing a CTA, if you're doing an MRI of the patient, um, any of these orders like a TTE, TEE, whatever you're, you're asking for. And then uh, after you place your like your regular labs, you have to think like, let's say this patient showed up with a stroke or let's say this patient showed up with a GI bleed, right? And you need GI to be involved in the patient's, in the patient's care. So, so what are you gonna do? How, well, you're gonna consult, right, GI. But cons consulting the consultant team, actually there's an order for it. So you really have to place consult orders. And this, this might be different from hospital to hospital. And my old hospital did not have consult orders. We used to just call them, we're done. But most of the hospitals you might be working at, they require you to place like a consult order to officialize, uh, to officialize the, the consult, okay? And then finally, very important is you wanna place order for medications. So what kind of medications, what kind of therapies you want the patients, uh, the patient to be on, okay? Hello. Um, when you reach here to the point of like uh, putting medications, I like to kind of classify it into two, two separate types of medications, okay? Uh, the, the first type is your active treatment medications. This is the medications you're going to give this patient to treat the hospital, whatever is going on in the hospital. Okay. So these things will include what? Include your antibiotics. These things will include, you know, your steroids, um, your whatever diuretics, if you're treating, you know, um, your fluids, if you're treating specific fluids, etc. whatever. So these are the things you're giving the patient now to treat the active problem that you're dealing with. So antibiotic steroids, whatever, okay? And the other type of medications that you also have to take into account is the home medications. And this is something that people forget. Then like enter the patient shows up, because the patient listed on home medications, like 12 different medications. You know, they have thyroxine, they have warfarin, they have like all these meds, but then they just come into the hospital for pneumonia. You really have to continue their home medications or they're gonna get those complications, okay? So you're gonna have to go through each medication and then you're gonna either hold versus continue, okay? Hella, there is one specific kind of example for uh, the home medication, which is, the diabetes meds, especially if the person was on insulin or was not on insulin. So most of the time you hear about it. So somebody shows up with infection or they are on metformin at home. 
Would you continue or stop? What do you think? I think stop. Stop. Who votes? Who votes stop? Who votes continue? They have I like do vote for stop. Hmm? I vote for stop as well. Stop. Is there is there a reason why you want to stop? Uh, metformin um, has a side effect uh, in which the blood is more acidic. I think it makes the blood more acidic. Yeah. So uh, the thing is, met metformin uh, has a very rare side effect. And no, I'm 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 just you have to know it, but uh, it's it's not it's not really you know. You will never see it, but you have to know it. Metformin can induce lactic acidosis in people who have mild AKI, acute kidney injury. So if somebody has acute kidney injury or their chronic kidney disease, or you continue their metformin or they have sepsis on top of it, it might worsen or it might promote lactic acidosis in those patients. Yeah. So most of the time when somebody shows up with metformin, just put it on hold, okay? Put it on hold. Instead, what can you do with the? And what are you gonna do with the with the diabetes? How are you gonna treat their diabetes? Sliding scale. Sliding scale. So again, that's another talk. We can, by the way, we can talk about managing diabetes in the inpatient setting because I think uh, it gets confusing. Ooh, it sucks. Ooh, I hate it, but you should know it. Okay. But it's usually insulin. Okay. Hella insulin. How to manage the insulin in the inpatient? That's a whole different talk. We're not gonna go into it. But it's usually these people with diabetes. Most of the time, stop their hypoglycemic agents. Not hot hada who was just admitted tragoala, pioglitazone or something. Yeah, somebody is asking about diabetes for inpatient. Yes, I have a session for that, uh, Dina. So we can we can uh, we can discuss it. But yeah, like somebody hypoglycemic agents, whatever you really want to stop them, unless you have a good, unless you think you can manage it and you can continue. You know, it, it, it really at the end of the day, there's no right or wrong. But this is usually you stop it. You just put them on an insulin sliding scale or others will talk about it, okay? And then the rest of the medications, it depends. Like somebody hypertensive has antihypertensive but they're showing up with septic shock. You're not gonna continue their beta blockers. You're not gonna continue their amlodipine. You're gonna stop it. So this, you're gonna determine whether to hold or to continue the home medication based on your clinical judgment, all right? And then I come to a, a section called miscellaneous orders. Two adult miscellaneous orders. Adult, also, they fall under diagnostic and therapeutics. Adult miscellaneous orders, they are orders that usually are important for most patients who show up. And they're not, they can, they're not really part of the management and plan, but they're part of the peripheral management and plan, okay? And, We'll start by the first one is DVT prophylaxis. Okay, so DVT prophylaxis is, is important for all patients. Some patients more than others, but um, a lot of the time you will have to start them on DVT prophylaxis. And how do you prophylact for DVT in, in, in patients? Uh, with the law, uh, with the clicksan. Click so low molecular weight heparin. Yeah. Anything else? Can you use heparin? Uh, you can uh, in a prof in a uh, prophylactic. Compression the lower limbs is the moment they're not to heparin. Okay, good. So, so, so there's two two uh, two kind of ways, right? You either use mechanical mechanical ways. Okay, and these mechanical ways include what we call SCD, right? Sequential compression devices, okay, versus medical. And the medical is gonna be either heparin, okay? And they usually, uh, it's different doses. And uh, my, <laughs> my go-to dose is usually 5,000 units BID. Okay, this is my own whatever, but there's no right or wrong, okay? Versus low molecular weight heparin, okay? The most common one here, you will hear about it, is enoxaparin. And nobody says enoxaparin, lemetijilohon. People say what? Love inox. That's like the common, stupid, generic, like, uh, trade name. Uh, let me ask you a question. Um, 
Is there a difference between using mechanical versus Lovinox or heparin? Who gets more DVTs? Anybody? Mechanical. Mechanical. It sounds like it, صح? And heparin is like systemic, or, you know, it's better. Actually, uh, there was a study. There was a study showing there's no difference. There's no difference in DVTs in either mechanical versus heparin or, or low molecular heparin. And uh, it, it was a big New England Journal study. So uh, there's really no difference. The only problem is it's annoying. Adult sequential devices, it's annoying for the patient. They have to be tied in bed. Uh, they don't like it, but they want to move around, they can't. So really try to avoid it. Try to avoid using SCDs. Try to use the heparin or low molecular weight heparin. Um, my other question to you is heparin versus lovinox versus low molecular weight heparin. When to use which? How do you know? Renal function plays a role. Renal function, exactly. So if you have somebody who has CKD, or has acute kidney injury, okay, then use heparin. If no CKD, no AKI, then you can use low molecular weight heparin, okay? The other thing, some, sometimes FINAS, Biju, Min Allah, they have their, 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 their prophylactic. Who are these people? Mean Biju Heka already, you don't need to put them on either heparin, low molecular weight, or SCDs. Who are these people? Who do you think? AFib. AFib. Yeah, why? Already they're on anticoagulation. So or already on anticoagulation. So some people are already on anticoagulation. Khalas, you're done. You don't need to. Like some people are on apixaban, rivaroxaban, whatever. You don't need to start them on anything. All you need to do is say... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say it. Oh, sorry. Then you just continue their anticoagulation, their home anticoagulation, okay? Any questions about this? Okay, cool. Let's move on. Number two, GI prophylaxis. What's GI prophylaxis? So prophylaxis against peptic ulcer disease, development of peptic ulcer disease, صح? Uh, it's really, this GI prophylaxis thing is not a slam dunk. No one does it regularly. No one will fault you if you don't do it. Leenno, even multiple studies, it's like controversial kind of whether you need to do it or not. Most people do it. So you don't need to if you don't want to. Okay. But usually you start them on, you know, H2, H2 blockers or you start them on PPI, you know, once daily, usually PO daily. Okay. And this will like maybe, maybe prevent stress ulcers. But it's not like a slam dunk, okay? Unless somebody is ventilated, high dose steroids, something like that, then you can start them on PPI. But usually it's, it's not really like, uh, it's not really a thing, but you will see people asking you about it. Hey, the patient needs GI prophylaxis, okay? Um, and then one of, one of the most important things is diet order, again, how you don't even think about it when you start intern year if you've never done you know any kind of prolonged uh, sub intern year or, or something you will forget about it you will like few diet order you know like diet order is npo or not npo and heck and my thought process when i came here like yeah it's either you know your npo or you can eat easy oh my god it's like very complicated it's not that easy okay so what is diet order? I'll give you examples. So example of diet order is NPO. Okay, this is easy. So that's Kaman and the cardiac diets. Kaman and the renal diets. Kaman and the diabetic diets. Okay. Also, uh, you have like a two gram sodium diet or restriction. Okay. You have low protein diets. These you should know. Okay. You have low fat diets. And then you have neutropenic diet. Anybody knows what neutropenic diet is? Sounds weird, so like why, what's gonna be different for these people in that land of neutropenia? What do you guys think? 
شو هي؟ احكي اجين معقمه صوتك معقمه حط دي تول حط دي تول يا اسمع اتس فيري كلوز سو هاو دو يو كيف بتعقم الاكل؟ ويل كوكت يعني مثلا يا ويل كوكت يا الا كتبت افويدنس اوف رو فيجيتابلز فروت يس اكزاكتلي سو هدول الناس نيوتروبينيك دايت ذي بويل ايفري ثينج بويل كل الاكل تبعهم يو كانت جيف ذيم اني رو فيجيتابلز كاروتس وات ايفر ايفري ثينج از بويلد هلا دزنت ميك ا ديفرنس اي ثينك ذير واز ا ستادي ريسنتلي وعملوا ذي فاوند نو ديفرنس بس خلص بيبل ستيل دو ات نيوتروبينيك بريكوشنز نيوتروبينيك دايت وات ايفر اوكي سو ذيس از فيري امبورتنت فور يو تو نو اوكي What else? What else do you think there's diets? مين كمان عنده make restrictions? احنا جماعتنا شو restrictions؟ هلا واحد you admit somebody Muslim, you're gonna put them a normal diet? What do you think? Oh, no pork um, for certain people. No, no pork, okay. But even a bigger, there's a bigger kind of uh, umbrella. No pork, مش بس no pork. Halal. Halal, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Halal, kosher, vegan. You know, these things you don't think about, but you have to place them because otherwise the patient is not going to eat or you're going to be going against the whatever. And like hospitals know this and they have these accommodations, okay? So you, you should know these things. So these are the, the kind of diets in general. I'm sure there is more, but in general, you should know at least these, okay? هلا after the diet okay after the diet you should know that there's something else there's also supplements okay شو يعني supplements supplements يعني these are things apart from the diet that you're giving the patient on a regular basis for them to eat okay so uh, the supplements uh, are like protein shakes essentially they're protein shakes you need to know a few of them but In my opinion, you should know at least two of them, okay? The two of them you're going to know are if somebody is non-diabetic, if somebody is non-diabetic, you can give them something called Insure. This is a supplemental, like, uh, protein, okay? And this, you know, you can give BID, TID, whatever. If they're diabetic, okay, then you will give them something called Glucerna. Okay, this, again, BID or TID. Again, these are supplements to the diet and you give it to somebody who's frail, can't eat well, they need high protein, but you can't give them protein. So they give them the shakes to, to take on a regular basis. Okay. And another thing about the diet also you should know is the consistency of the diet. Should any consistency of the diet? Yani is the diet regular, has everything? Well, is it soft? full liquid, stuff like that. So you need to know regular diet is regular, okay? It's regular consistency. Then soft, chew any soft. Soft usually, you know, you know, no solid, you know, no solid like chicken or like, uh, like solid essentially, okay? Also, you have something called full liquid diet. Then you have clear liquid diet, okay? And then you have pureed diet and you have thickened diet, okay? And again, when you start, you have no idea what the hell is the difference between all of these, but I'll make it clear for you. Clear, clear liquid, do you any clear liquid? It's like jello, broth, my. يعني كل شيء مي، اوكي؟ هلا شو الدفرنس بين كلير ليكويد وفول ليكويد؟ وات دو يو جايز ثينك؟ فول ليكويد يعني ممكن زي بلندد سموذي، نو اتس نوت يعني كونسستنسي ثيكر شوي اكثر، اي جاست انا ات ساوندز لايك ات صح؟ لما تحكي فول ليكويد يمكن يكون كونسستنت بس اتس نوت لايك ذات، فول ليكويد دايت از كلير ليكويد بلس ديري برودكت، ديري And no, essentially milk or any anything that has to do with dairy products. So milk products, okay? So clear liquid does not have dairy product, while full liquid does. So this is a, a really good, you know, differentiation between them, okay? Uh, pureed diet, blended, 
كل شيء مخلوط ببعضه اتس ديسكاستنج بس سم بيبل هاف تو دو ذات اوكي وثيكند دايت هذول الناس اللي دي دي هاف بروبلم دي هاف ديسفاجيا سبيشلي اوروفارينجيال ديسفاجيا they have problems swallowing liquids more than solids صح solids بيفوتوا بس ال liquids they <coughs> they gag on it and, or like they choke on it so هذول الناس you give them thickened water حتى المي عندهم like special المي المي بتكون it's like a jello again I would <laughs> I tried it once it's not good <laughs> بس uh, you have to do what you have to do صح okay very important هلا There is one kind of exclamation that you should be aware of. Uh, there is no like security So you really have to be aware of sneaking food. <laughs> okay? يعني, for example, I'll give you an example. Karanna uh, Marid, he's in CHF exacerbation. I'm going to two gram. Sodium, حاطينه على one one and a half liter of water restriction. But he's still gaining weight. He's still like, uh, you know, uh, retaining fluids. مع إنه we're max max uh, furosemide and stuff. But then we figured out, you know, he's been like, you know, ordering papayas. جيبوا على المستشفى. He's eating. <laughs> so you really sometimes you should think outside the box. You think, you know, maybe the patient is uh, is sneaking food. Okay. I'll just to give you an example, just a quick example, okay? Example. Let's say you have an old, let's say you have an old diabetic patient with CHF exacerbation. Um, uh, what kind of diet are you gonna give? What do you think? Cardiac and diabetic. Cardiac, diabetic. So cardiac plus diabetic diet. That's it? How restriction of fluids. Plus restriction of fluids. Plus two gram sodium restriction. Plus, and I would also give him glucerna BID because he's old. So that would be your that would be your kind of diet order is that I'm gonna give this patient this stuff, okay? So you see it it becomes it becomes shway <laughs> heka bothersome and no, you have to think about it so you don't know you know again لما أنت تبلش راح تحط للكل regular diet but then the nurse is gonna freak out on you كي لك شو تحط له أنت regular diet the guy can't eat blah 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 so knowing them at least will give you you know a, a head start. Okay, okay, and then just to move on. Uh, after this, there's also others, other diagnostic and therapeutic orders. Shuhadol other therapeutic and diagnostic orders. These are the ancillary or like different orders than actual uh, medications or, or, or stuff. These are more like activities, okay, that you need to know that the nurse needs to know, okay? So these include daily weights, For example, if you want the patient to be daily, weight daily. Uh, believe it or not, out of bed is an order for the patient. You know, like, uh, please get the patient out of bed. So you will find out of bed to chair or out of bed to stretcher or something like that. Okay. Uh, incentive spirometry is, is, is also another order. Okay. So these, these things you should know. Uh, some people are not muted. Hold on one sec. Okay. All right, cool. And then finally, again, you should know these ancillary orders. So I think there's a lot of orders, huh? well, These things like you, it, 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 it's not intuitive, but uh, you will like slowly, like you will get uh, kind of accustomed to it. So. Ancillary orders that you should know is something called PT and OT. Show you any PT, OT. It's physical therapy and occupational therapy. Um, and the question is, why the hell do you care? Like, why are you placing this kind of order? So the reason you're placing this order is to know where to discharge the patient. 
does the pay like where to discharge the patient? Is he gonna go to a short-term rehab? Is they gonna go to a nursing home? Are they gonna go home or home with services or something? Okay. Now then respiratory therapist order. Um, this, this is important for patients who have trach, who are vented. Uh, it's important for you to place that kind of consult order for the patient to be seen, okay? Um, if you think that you can't, if you think that the diet order is too complicated, and yani somebody shows up, they have a very restrictive diet, or you don't know exactly what to do, or they're cachectic, or you feel like you're not the one who should be ordering that stuff, then you place a dietitian order or a nutritionist, okay? And then finally, if you're not sure whether the patient is able to swallow or not, then you can play an official speech and language specialist uh, pathologist order. This is called a swallow or speech and swallow evaluation, okay? Where they will evaluate and they will give you uh, the actual consistency, okay? Of the, of the, of the food that the patient may, may be able to take. Okay, cool. I think we we ran out of. Uh, are you guys okay? You still have time, or Lashu? What's your situation? You're okay. I'm okay. You're okay. Okay, cool. I mean, we can keep going. I I, I don't mind. I know we we went over like now two forty minutes, but sadly, and it's fine. Um. So this is. Can we have a screenshot from the notes because we don't see the the full page. Yeah, 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 yeah. I will send the notes. I will send these notes, Mas Akhalas, of course. Yeah, no, I'm writing them, I'm writing them out for you. Uh, any questions about these orders? Anybody has any any comments before we move on? Um, I just have a question regarding physical therapy, occupational therapy. Mm -hmm. So um, this order is uh, regarding only discharge or it's dealing only with discharge, not with the physical therapy that the patient has to become while being hospitalized. Yeah, so uh, what happens in Nuinta, you admit a patient, a lot of the times you will have an idea how many days the patient is going to be in the hospital. Okay, pneumonia, you're going to say, okay, if they, everything goes well, then it's three days, they look frail, so maybe I want to know. So a lot of times you place these orders even on admission just to get things started because if you're late you will delay the admission so somebody was asking do we do we place these orders on admission yes so all these orders the more you place the better and no it just means that you're anticipating what's going to happen to the patient okay so again and i i give these examples why we go to extremes and until you don't know any of this you, you've never discharged a patient you've never admitted a patient so you don't know but this will give you an idea and you, you have to place all these orders and no otherwise things won't get won't happen okay and then when you start your senior probably will help you but if you know it will be perfect okay so yeah uh, pt ot order they will come evaluate the patient and then see what kind of uh, discharge accommodations they need. Uh, if they need physical therapy uh, or, or um, uh, yeah, if they need physical therapy, they will get it done during also their uh, hospitalization. No, if they need physical therapy, um, they physical therapy takes time. So what's gonna happen is that the PT or the physical therapist is gonna recommend that the patient be discharged to an acute rehab facility or a, um, or a skilled nursing facility. Uh, I have another lecture that I think we should be next. Uh, we can talk about it, not today, but it's about discharging, how to discharge a patient and all these kind of different things. And when you discharge a patient, what happens? But really this becomes important uh, when discharging the patient, the PTOT thing. Okay, cool. Uh, let me turn off this. Uh, okay. Thanks, man. So again, the art of documentation, the HNP note, remains an art. Oh, it is different from person to person. Oh, people will do it differently. Oh, there is absolutely no right or wrong in doing it. Um, but I will tell you, um, this is how I do it. Oh, you feel free to use it or lose it or use other methods, okay? 
uh, when you start an HMP, uh, when, when I'm writing an HMP, صراحة, in my mind, I like to draw a timeline, okay? And this is the timeline of the patient's, essentially the patient's course, okay? And based on this timeline, I like um, to kind of draw the course of, of what the patient is doing. For example, uh, I start when the patient is doing well, okay? So this is patient is doing well, all right? And then, you know, his symptoms kind of start to occur here. So this is the point where he became sick. صح? And then, you know, the symptom worsen a little bit. And this is, you know, this is the point where the chief complaint kind of started with the patient in their mind. And then eventually things get worse and then prompting them to come to the ER, essentially. So this is at home. And then eventually when things get worse, the patient comes to the ER, okay? And then in the ER, you know, there is a certain amount of time where the patient spends in the ER, okay? This is what, what, I, what we call the ER course. So this is what happens in the ER course, okay? And then, you know, so here is ER. And then the patient eventually is transferred from the ER to another place, usually to you, to the floor. Okay, so this is gonna be the floor. Okay, and that's gonna be the, the floor course. Okay, and then you're gonna get all the way to now. This is the moment, like this moment of time, when you are writing the HNP. So, so you are writing the HNP right here. At this point, at this point. But Anna, what I like to do is I like to describe this timeline in the HNP as I'm writing it. Okay, Lana, you already know what's happening, what happened. Okay. So I'll give you kind of the headlines of what goes into in general, my my HNP. Again, you can write it the way you want to write. Uh, it's different really from person to person, but this is what I like to do, okay? So I start by writing the chief complaint. Okay, so this patient, we're seeing them because of the chief complaint, shortness of breath, okay? Then I write the history of presenting illness, which is this, this essentially, this is the HPI, this, until the patient got to the ER, okay? Um, and then in the ER, you're gonna write, what I like to do is to document once the patient came in at this point, what were the vital signs, okay, on presentation? Okay, as well as if there was any pertinent positives or negatives, okay? Sorry, we got some technical difficulties here. Okay, cool. So, and then if there is like any pertinent negatives or positives that you need to mention, okay? And then what I like to write afterwards, you know, we got the patient, you know, we got the patient here to the ER, so now you want to write right here is the ER course. صح? So that's the next step is my ER course. So what's ER course? ER course means what kind of diagnostics did they do? What kind of therapies did they give? Okay. And then after that, I, you know, he was admitted. And then you write, you know, the patient was admitted to blah, blah, blah for further evaluation. Okay, so that's can, kind of gonna be the, the, the way I write it out in words, okay? So now after the patient came from the ER to the floor, now he's admitted, there's a short period of time where there's a course that happened on the floors, okay? And so this course is essentially, what did you do? So this is the floor, okay? Uh, the floor or, you know, overnight sometimes, it's when you're admitting a patient overnight course, 
essentially, what did you do? What did you do overnight? What did you do to the patient so far? So what did you do, essentially? That's really the, the key point here, is, is, is you uh, doing the things here on the floor, okay? After you write all that, now that you got the patient to now, so we got the patient to here to now where you're writing the HMP, then you can write their ancillary history. You know, you can write their you know, family history, you can write their social history. Um, you can write um, the past medical history and past surgical history. The home medications, don't, rem don't forget to write them down. A lot of these things, they will like just pull them in for you. Some people like to write the PCP of the patient. What's there, the PCP, and then what's the pharmacy that the patient is using, just to keep track of these things, okay? So that's in terms of like the kind of the HMP, the story, okay? Then what comes next is your physical exam, okay? So the physical exam is really when you saw the patient, what did you see? And again, this is like now. So you're gonna write their vital signs. So you're gonna put the vital signs now, plus a full physical, the full physical exam that you've done. Okay, so you're gonna mention everything essentially, you know, neuro, DRE, don't, people forget that, so don't, don't forget the DRE, because that's like pretty important to mention, especially if somebody is, is having bleeding or something. Okay, and then this, the following section is essentially the ancillary data that you gathered so far, the pertinent data. So pertinent data. And that's going to include labs, um, micro imaging, outside hospital stuff, anything that you gathered that you feel is important, previous procedures, previous surgeries that are important, just put them in here so that people will see kind of what, what happened to the patient, what kind of data that, that you have. Okay. And then comes the most important part of your HNP. No one will read it. You know what's going to happen? People are going to start reading and then they're going to scroll all the way down. Okay, they're not going to read anything you wrote and they're going to go down to your assessment and plan. And this is where, you know, this is where the money's at. This is where you will shine. This is where you will show until you understand. You have an understanding of what's happening to the patient. You have an understanding of what you want to do to the patient. Okay. And so you really here want to start by summarizing kind of everything about the patient as much as possible. Come on, it's tough. It's not easy. But I try to summarize it as much as possible. So here you need to write a brief uh, summary um, or sometimes people call it a two-liner about the patient, okay? So really what you can say is this is a, you know, patient is a, you know, blah, blah, blah year old man or woman so, uh, with past medical history of, you know, you're gonna mention pertinent, pertinent stuff. That's what you're gonna end up writing. Um, who presented with, you know, whatever the chief complaint is. Okay. And then found to have whatever your working diagnosis is and then admitted to medicine for further evaluation or something okay so this is because at this point most likely you have a working diagnosis somebody presents with like shortness of breath you found that they have copd exacerbation or they have chf exacerbation or if you don't know you can say this versus that or you can say you know, you don't need to mention a diagnosis. You can say present with shortness of breath and admit it for further management. You don't need to mention a diagnosis. So um, sometimes it's difficult to have an actual diagnosis, but this is why you need to kind of be perfect if you have an actual diagnosis, okay? Um, and then what you want to do is, again, this is different from hospital to hospital, attending to attending, ICU versus floor setting. But in general, most people will write problem by problem. Uh, assessment and plan. So you're going to write every problem that the patient has and then their assessment. Okay. So I'm going to give you a theoretical patient. Okay. The theoretical patient that I'm thinking about is Lenny and I'm in GI. I'm just going to have somebody with GI bleeding. Okay. Came in with hematemesis. Okay. So the brief summary would be I don't know. The patient is a 58 year old man 
um, with history of diabetes and hypertension presented with an episode of hematemesis in the setting of an upper or, or in the setting of GI bleeding here for further management. Okay, so my problem number one, usually we write like hash, some people write hashtags, some people write like number one. Um, I like to use the hashtag because it doesn't number you, you don't know. Uh, you don't know how many problems you will end up having. So, you know, my problem number one is gonna be GI bleed, okay? And then again, here it's more art than science. Usaraha, and I, I like, in my opinion, I think it's, it's a very good way to start your year because you're gonna learn a lot by doing this. In the Klamatuktubil assessment and plan, you wanna write, you wanna think about what the patient came in with, what's your differential diagnosis, what else could it be? And why it's not this or that? Start excluding and writing it in your assessment and plan. Instead of just saying like, some people, I will tell you, some people are gonna write GI bleed secondary to peptic ulcer, and then they're gonna start their plan. Okay, that's valid, but that's not helpful for you. It's not helpful for others who read your notes. Uh, and so I feel like you can put a lot in your notes and the more you put, the better people will appreciate what you do and the more you will learn at the end of the day which is what's the most important what the most important thing is is you to learn okay and so i'll give you what i would write typically what i would write for something with with a gi bleed okay so i would write like the patient presented with um i don't know like two days uh of of melena plus one episode of coffee ground emesis. Okay, so I established, I established why do I think this is a GI bleed? So I'm just gonna, you know, let's, let's highlight this in like blue. Okay, so this is kind of why that, why do I think, why do I think what I think? Why do I think this is a GI bleed? Okay, because the patient presented with these things. All right. And then the, the following sentence or the following few sentences I'm going to mention my differential diagnosis. Okay, so my differential diagnosis at this point is likely an upper, upper GI bleed. Okay, versus less likely a lower. Why do I think it's less likely a lower GI bleed, given the coffee grounds? So, so I now I established that I have a differential diagnosis. So here, I'm just gonna highlight in green. So this is your differential diagnosis. And you also mentioned, why not? Again, you excluded one of them. You said, okay, Goffy ground emesis. So it's less likely lower GI bleed. It's more likely upper GI bleed. Again, you establish some sort of differential, okay? And then you can also expand and know this upper GI bleed secondary two, then you're gonna go more into your differential, okay? What's your differential for an upper GI bleed? Usually it's something like peptic ulcer disease, you know, Mallory Weiss uh, tear, um, you can say esophagitis, malignancy, right? AVM, okay? So now you establish that you have Again, I'm just gonna highlight this in green, meaning that you establish that you have some sort of differential diagnosis and you're working about this GI bleed. So you're exploring more, okay? Then you have to mention what is the most likely diagnosis that you think that's happening or try, try to, okay? What I like to do is to mention the most likely and I'm gonna say most likely, okay? PUD given the recent, I'm just gonna make this up, okay? Given the recent NSAID use, okay? So here I established what's my most likely diagnosis that I think it's a, it's a peptic ulcer disease in the setting of NSAID use, um, maybe something else, and smoking or alcohol use or something, okay? And then one very important thing is you wanna exclude things that this is not. So you mentioned the most likely, now mention the most unlikely, or what do you wanna exclude, the dangerous stuff you wanna exclude? 
For example, for an upper GI bleed, Anna personally, I want to exclude that there's a variceal bleed. So in this patient, I'm just gonna assume their platelets were 200. So I'm gonna say it's unlikely variceal bleed given no history of liver disease, of chronic liver disease, plus platelets are more than 150, okay? So this is, again, very important to mention. Why do you think this is not something, okay? Any questions about this kind of format, about how to write your assessment out loud? Um, I'm sorry, I just have one question. Yeah. So basically, um, you wrote a two-liner in this hashtag, and uh, in the assessment, you wrote as well a two-liner. Um, so basically you described or, the, or you, you wrote three or four times um, the history of the patient in this whole documentation. Correct. So this brief two-liner, this, this would be more about the holistic view of what the patient is here for, okay? When you write this two-liner, you're not gonna repeat, you know, the patient has hypertension, diabetes, whatever. You're just gonna mention something that's very, very pertinent to this. For example, GI bleed, the pertinent to the GI bleed is the hematemesis and melanoma. I don't care about like the patient. Then you refer that this patient, then you know who this patient is, okay? Even if you repeat, and even if here you wrote patient presented with melena found to have an upper GI bleed or found to have GI bleed admitted for further management, when you write GI bleed here as the new hashtag, the main problem, it's okay to repeat a little bit about what you mentioned. Then again, this is the main problem. You really wanna expand upon this problem a little bit more. So it's okay to be a little repetitive, okay? It feels weird, but it's okay. Then you will see these notes will carry on they will help you a lot when you write your final note, the discharge summary and the course of the patient when you're trying to discharge the patient, okay? And every day you look at this note and then you start to reduce a little bit of it. The more, you know, the more definitive you are, and tomorrow when the patient gets scoped, they know they have an ulcer, then خلص, you remove all these, you know, all this stuff that you wrote about differential, you have to remove it now, and then you can modify the notes as needed. Okay. Uh, and you, uh, this will also be written in the HBI. Am I right? This is this is I'm writing you, I'm writing to you what is what you're gonna write. This is not just what you're yeah. gonna present, this is what you're gonna write. This is what goes into the into the chart essentially. Yeah. Okay. And then what people like to do after you write this small history, small summary, is you wanna write your management. Okay, so now you're gonna write your management. Your management usually people what they like to do is to write it as bullet points. For example, here, you know, I'm gonna see IV access, two large bore cannulas, then you're gonna say PPI, okay, GTT. Remember this, GTT <laughs> means drip, okay? Uh, some Latin word, I have no idea. Some of you might be familiar with it. Or you can say 40 IV BID or something, okay? Maintain hemoglobin above eight, for example. Um, and then you're going to say GI consult. And then don't, don't forget to go and make sure that you have all these orders in place. Okay. And then you're going to, you know, I don't know, trend hemoglobin Q12 hours. And then you're going to NPO past midnight for possible EGD. You know, so now you have kind of um, your, your, uh, your plan. Hold, hold antihypertensives. Stop anticoagulation, you know, because the patient might be bleeding, and then SCD for DVT prophylaxis, right? So this patient, you can't put them in heparin because they're bleeding. So, okay. So you, obviously there might be more, but you can write them like this, the like what what you're doing for the patient or what's your plan for the patient. Okay. Once you've done this, okay, then you're gonna move on to problem number two. Okay, problem two might be maybe at the same time the patient has a pneumonia. Okay, so the question is, how do you know which problem is number one? Usually, problem number one is the problem that's brought to the that brought the patient to the hospital in the first place was admitted for. Also, problem number one is the problem that's keeping the patient in the hospital. 
Some people have pneumonia, but I don't know, Z-Pak, azithromycin, it doesn't need to stay in the hospital. Because this patient, what's keeping them in the hospital is the GI bleed, not the pneumonia, for example. Okay, if not, problem number two was pneumonia. Again, you're gonna mention like brief stuff about the problem number two, and then you're gonna mention like your, your assessment, your plan for it. Again, it's gonna be the same kind of way. A patient came in, had shortness of breath, chest X-ray showed pneumonia, most likely viral versus bacterial, blah, blah, blah. You know, you're gonna mention your diagnostic kind of thought process about what's going on, okay? And then once you're done with all the problems, problem number one, two, three, whatever, all the things that's active in the patient, then you're gonna write the chronic medical problems, okay? So what's the chronic medical problem for this patient? For example, hypertension, okay? Then you're gonna say what you're doing with the hypertension. You're gonna say, okay, I'm holding, hold amlodipine, right? You're holding his amlodipine, for example. A uh, patient has, I don't know, has BPH. A lot of people you will see has uh, benign prosthetic hyperplasia and they, they're on tamsulosin or finasteride. I don't know, not like continue finasteride because it doesn't really cause any problems, okay? And then you've got the diabetes and then we talked about diabetes. We will have eventually to talk about it. Um, but for example, in this guy, like hold metformin and then you know, you're gonna do your plan for the diabetes, okay? Um, and the plan is going to be what you're going to give insulin, basal, what you're going to give pre-meal, pre what you're going to give a sliding scale, okay? Um, and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, so this is very important. Uh, just a quick note when you're admitting a patient, because this is going to be a recurrent theme. Some people have AFib. A lot of people have AFib, okay? So th for this patient who's having a GI bleed, you're going to hold the beta blockers for now, because you don't want them to be... Um, to be like hypotensive. But if you have a patient who's admitted to the hospital who has AFib, um, they might be, uh, you might wanna continue the beta blockers. But generally when somebody gets admitted to the hospital, you wanna convert all their long acting medications to short acting medications. And one of the most common ones that you're gonna see in AFib is some people will be on metoprolol, succinate, Okay, and the other dose, is, the other medication is called metoprolol tartrate. Okay, and the metoprolol succinate is called toprol XL, and the tartrate is called lopressor. Okay, you need to know these, unfortunately. The metoprolol succinate is a Q24 hours, it's long acting, while this one is a Q12 hours. When people get admitted to the hospital, you really want to convert, switch, same dose. Like if somebody is on 25 Toprol, put them on 12 and a half BID of Lopressor when they're in the hospital. Why? Because you want to be able to hold it when you want to hold it and quickly get rid of it instead of keeping it for 24 hours, okay? But I'm mentioning this specifically because it's one of the most common medications. When that's like, I didn't used to know it a lot, okay? Um, but you should kind of familiarize yourself with it. All right. And then finally, we're not done yet. So it feels like we're done writing this note, but we're not done yet because finally uh, you will forget. Remember, we talked about all these things. Like we talked about the nutrition. We talked about the prophylaxis. We didn't mention them yet, right? So I like to have in my note at the end of the note, something called thin PCD. Okay, we, we, we'll finish in less than 10 minutes, guys, okay? This is gonna be the last session. Two FENPCD. FENPCD stands for fluids, electrolytes, nutrition, prophylaxis, code status, and disposition. Okay, fluids is gonna be what kind of fluids you're giving the patient. For example, you're putting them on LR at 150 cc per hour or you're diuresing them. Electrolytes, you wanna mention that, you know, I'm repleting the electrolytes, you know, PRN. If you have a specific parameters, for example, I wanna keep the K above four, uh, above, um, sorry. Um, I wanna keep the K above four, for example, because I'm diuresing. Um, nutrition, this is where you mention, you know, the patient needs, I don't know, like a cardiac, diabetic, diet, blah, 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 consistency. 
And then prophylaxis, you're gonna mention that the patient is on PPI drip and then SCD for DVTs. And then the code status, you're gonna mention patient's full code and then confirmed by patient or by family or by form, by the document, the legal form. And then finally, your disposition is gonna be, where is the patient going? So the patient for now is gonna be admitted as an inpatient, but pending like PTOT eval for, uh, for discharge, prior to discharge, okay? And so once you write all this stuff, then you kind of have a, yeah, no, you kind of, you do have like a full note that, you know, that, that explains what you're doing for the patients. Okay. This is pretty much it. This is how you admit a patient in a nutshell. Um, you guys have any questions? Cool. All good? Uh, what will be the main difference between the assessment, um, uh, the history that you write in the assessment, and between the things you write in the HPI? So in the HPI, HPI, we're just writing a story. Here, mm -hmm. we're, just, we're, we're just writing like the story of the patient, you know, what's kind of what happened to them and what, what brought them to the floor and all that stuff. That's your okay. assessment. Your assessment will contain differential diagnosis. It will contain wording. Actually, another thing I want to mention, it is highly recommended, highly recommended. Um, that you include uh, PubMed articles in, in your assessment. So for example, uh, let's say you wanna make a decision that I wanna, I think the patient has, uh, for example, this one, this one, it's easy, صح? like let's say I want to support uh, this statement. And I can't unlikely very severe bleed and there's no history of liver disease with platelets above 150. What I can do is I can cite the article that shows the sensitivity and specificity of a platelet of more than 150 to exclude very seal bleeding. And then you can put it in your notes right here. You can put the citation after your statement, or you can put it as a link as well. People will appreciate that so much. It will show that you really know what you're talking about. Um, so I really highly encourage you that to try to find um, articles that are per pertinent to your history, we try to include them because not only you will show that you know, but in the command, you will benefit a lot. Especially in the diagnosis, like un uncertain, you don't know exactly what's next, then you can really like show that, you know, you can learn or you can show that you, you learned and you know. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Muhammad. Yeah, yeah. No, so no, Thank no, you so much. No problem, guys. Yalla, best of luck. I'll upload it. We can do another session soon, okay? Perfect. Um, you. Will you let us know uh, regarding the diabetes session? Yes, yes. I will I will share on JAP, I guess, uh, and then we can do those sessions. No problem. Thank you so much, again. Yalla, tusba ala khair. Bye-bye. Thank you so, so much. This was amazing. Bye-bye. Thank you.